Good afternoon from uh, the Food Research Center here in Fermoy, County Cork in the Republic of Ireland. Welcome to our third uh, InfoGest Food Digestion webinar. Um, today's webinar is on uh, the topic of absorption uh, models and intestinal barriers. And I would like to introduce the other panelists, uh, if you can show yourself there, please. Um, we have uh, Mern Egan uh, from our Food Research Center, uh, who is helping us with a, a, a webinar here. We have uh, Linda, Linda Giblin from our own Food Research Center here in Moore Park. And we have Adam Maziazanka, nice try, Adam, uh, uh, from Dance, Gdansk University. Uh, so without much delay, I would like to introduce the first speaker. Um, we usually have two speakers. Um, the first one today is Linda, and she will give a nice overview of the um, uh, absorption models and the intestinal barrier. Linda is a senior scientist here in, the, here in Chagas. Her research interests are food bioactives and the gut barrier. She's a leader of one of the work groups, uh, work group three on uh, intestinal um, barrier models. She's also a leader in the EU cost action that focus on food for the older adults, uh, adults which is Nut Redox. And uh, last but not least, she is an associate editor for the Journal of Functional Food. So I hand over to uh, Linda. All talks have been uh, uh, pre-recorded, um, thankfully, because we are still on the conservative side there. And uh, subsequently, you can find the uh, uh, recorded webinar on the YouTube channel, and I show that to you later. Okay, very good. Over to you, Linda. Okay, so thank you for that introduction. And so let's start on food digestion and the gut barrier. So this webinar is really going to um, divide it into four sections. There's the gut barrier, the in vitro models, the ex vivo models, and some data from our lab. So in the last webinar, it focused on food digestion. So the mouth for mastication and mixing, the stomach for enzyme digestive enzymes, that very low acidic pH, the peristaltic waves, the small intestine, which has the addition of bile acids, the pancreatic digestive enzymes, that neutral pH, and of course the brush border enzymes. And then on to the lower gut, which is the cecum and colon, which has the gut microbiota. The bacterial metabolites are all produced, the short chain fatty acids, the vitamins are taken up and water is retained. But in this webinar, I'm gonna talk about the small intestine because that is the main site for food absorption. And there are three sections, the duodenum, which is closest to the stomach, the jejunum, and the ileum, which is closest to the colon. And this tube is six meters in length, and it has a surface area of up to 250 meters squared because it has villi. This is what it looks like. All these villi protruding into the gut lumen. So inside the tube, it looks like this, millions and millions and millions of villi. And these villi in turn have all hair like projections. And these villi differ in length and width from the duodenum all the way down to the ileum. And here is H&E staining to show you the differences that occur from the duodenum to the ileum. And by the time they get to the ileum, there are also pairs, patches are quite abundant in the ileum, which have an immune function in the gut. And these are not present in the duodenum. So let's talk about this villi. This villi is the gut barrier. It has a single layer of cells and each cell has a tight junction with each other. And food has to pass through that single layer of cells to get to the blood um, system. So um, the blood capillaries will absorb the glucose and the amino acids and the lymphatic vessels will absorb the fatty acids and the glycerol. But this single layer of cells is not just one cell type, but it's actually made up of four different cell types. The first one are the enterocytes, and they are the absorptive cells, and they have 
they're the most abundant by far, and they have all these microvilli. Next is the goblet cells, and these are the mucus cells. And I think Andre showed you uh, when he swallowed the camera in the last webinar all the mucus that's produced in the gut. So these are quite common cells as well in that single air. Then you have the enter endocrine cells, and these produce hormones. They are sparsely populated through the gut barrier, but they're very important. They produce these satiety hormones that make us feel full, and of course the hunger hormone that makes us start eating our food. And then we have the panate cells, which produce digestive enzymes and antimicrobial peptides. And the really interesting thing about the villus is that the endocytes, the goblet and the endocrine cells, they migrate up to the tip as they age. And by the time they get to the tip of the villi, they just die by apoptosis. And the panthid cells, on the other hand, migrate down towards the crypts and they're renewed every, the whole villus is renewed every five to seven days during our lifetime, every five to seven days. So the top of the villus could be regarded as the old part and the crypts were regarded as the young villi. So how is food transported across the gut barrier? Well, if we talk about food digestion first, obviously the proteins go into amino acids, into small peptides, di and tripeptides, the fats into fatty acids, the carbohydrates into monosaccharides and disaccharides. So the gut lumen has all of this mixture of free amino acids, fatty acids, monosaccharides. But it has to be transported across that single layer of cells, that gut barrier, to get to the bloodstream. So how does it do that? There is paracellular transport, which is through those tight junctions. There is transcellular transport, which is a passive diffusion system through the cells. And then there is mediator transport, which is vesicle or carrier, where the food digester is literally brought up across the cells, is transported, actively transported across the cells to the blood. So what are the in vitro models that are present? That we can use. So the first one and the most commonly used one are the CACO2 cells and these are derived from a human colorectal carcinoma and you can grow them in transwell plates uh, for 21 days and they'll actually differentiate into enterocytes and these cells will be polarized and they'll have tight junctions and they'll have an apical brush border and you can measure these tight junctions by running an electrical current through them and measuring the resistance, the electrical resistance, and that's called the transepithelial electrical resistance. And it should be greater than 500 ohms centimeter squared. And then you know you have a tight junction formed. And that usually occurs around day 20, day 21. You can also measure permeability across these monolayers by using things like luciferase yellow or sodium fluorescein, applying it to the apical side and then measuring how much comes through on the basolateral side. But not only are they colon cell lines, but they're also a single cell type. So nowadays, we usually mix them with a different cell called the HD29 MTX, which are goblet cells, and they produce mucus. And so this is a co-culture in these transwell plates. And usually we, mi we mix them at a ratio of 3 to 1, CACO2 to HD29, but they can go up to about 9 to 1. So this is the most common co-culture that's used as a model of the intestinal barrier. But there are lots of other alternative cell lines that you could consider using as well to form your gut barrier. And they really depend on the animal. There are several available from young piglets or from um, an adult boar. There's a few from the human and the rat. Also it will depend on the location. Um, that they have been harvested from, the jejunum, the ileum, the colon or the duodenum, and indeed whether they've been derived from a cancerous cell. And what I would say is that all these cell line barriers do have limitations with real life, and you have to consider your primary research question. Are you trying to compare and contrast your results with your food component to others? And if so, I would recommend using the CACO2 HD29 since that's routinely used by a lot of scientists. But maybe you're looking for immune response and then maybe the IPIC J2 is much more suitable. There are other cells, that, um, cell lines that mimic 
the um, cell types in the gut barrier. They do not form the barrier. And these would be endocrine cell lines. So if you're looking for a response of you, um, a satiety response of your food, then you could look at these cell lines, STC1, NCIH716, or GLUTAG. But they don't form gut barriers. They're specifically endocrine cell lines. In terms of ex vivo models, well, I suppose the one that is most commonly used and has been around for a long, long time now are the using chambers. And really, this is where you take um, an intestinal tissue and you immediately apply it to a reservoir to form your barrier between the apical and the basolateral. And these have been multiplexed up to about 10 reservoirs, but they're still relatively low throughput. And the limitation, of course, is that the availability of healthy human samples. So usually you have to use pig samples and rat samples and you have to do the experiment straight away once you've collected the tissue. So next, then, there is the intestinal organoids and these are self-sustaining mini guts. And so what is, they really start with is that um, intestinal tissue is taken from the human, the rat or the pig. And from there, you isolate the crypts. And these crypts can be fully matured then um, over a seven day period until finally they become self-sustaining mini guts. So it's a very exciting part of research. But the one issue it has with food digesta is that these organoids face inwards. So they have an inward orientation, which means that the apical side is relatively inaccessible. So what people are doing now is trying to create these organoids, but having them having an outward orientation so we can use them much more readily for food digestion experiments. OK, so let's put together all these methodologies. So how do you use this work in the lab? So you take the food that you're interested in, the food component or the food matrix, and you perform an in vitro digestion, either a static digestion, semi-dynamic or dynamic digestion. In parallel, you grow your CACA2 HD29 co-cultures in these transwell plates. You allow them to differentiate for 21 days. You check your tight junction formation by your TER values, making sure it's greater than 500 ohm centimetres squared. Then you apply your digesta for two to four hours to the apical side. And you collect the basolateral and look for the food components that were permeable across this monolayer. So now I'm just going to talk to you about some of the data from our lab and how we've used all of these methodologies. So what we wanted to find out here was whether processing would affect the peptides that were permeable across the CACA2 monolayers. So we made infant milk formula. And we made it by two different methods in the pilot plant. One by high temperature, which is what is used routinely in infant formula manufacture. And the other method, the alternative method, was making it by cascade membrane filtered, filtration. And both of the IMF products that were made were microbially safe and met all the standards required. We then took each of these products and we digested it using a static infragest protocol for the infant gut. And that has a higher gastric pH, it has a shorter transit time, and it has lower enzyme activity than the adult protocol. So here we take the infant milk formula, and, and this is produced by the high temperature processing, and we have it digested. So we add it to our CACA2 uh, monolayer, and for two to four hours, and we collect the basolateral and look at the peptides that are coming through that are permeable across that monolayer. And this is a pie chart of the type of peptides that we picked up, 30 peptides from beta casein, seven from kappa casein, 21 for beta lactoglobulin. If we repeat that with IMF from, that was made by cascade membrane filtration, we find that we get a different profile of peptides. We get 42 peptides from beta casein, 34 from beta lactoglobulin. And in fact, if we look at these individual peptides, 
we find that there are several unique peptides crossing those CACO2 monolayers, which are dependent on, the, dependent on the processing type. So there are a lot of peptides that are in, in common, but there are also some unique peptides crossing the CACO2 monolayers. So processing does affect the peptides that are permeable across these barriers. Another um, research activity we were working on was whey proteins. We know that whey protein promotes muscle health. It does that because it's an easily digested protein. It's a high quality protein. It delivers essential amino acids and indeed branching amino acids to muscles. So athletes love it and they uh, use the whey protein bars or whey protein isolate. And in fact, it could also help uh, delay frailty in the older um, in the older person. But what we wanted to do was, we wanted to find out were there peptides capable of passing the gut barrier, which would also promote muscle health. So to do that, we took whey protein isolate um, that is commercially available, and we performed an in vitro digestion. In this case, it was a static adult protocol. And we grew our CACA2 HD29 co-cultures for 21 days, make sure they had tight junctions. And then we added this gastrointestinal digested whey protein isolate to the apical side. And we collected again the basolateral and performed um, peptide analysis of the basolateral. And this just gives you an overview of what we got. So at the very top is all the peptides that we identified in the apical side. And then at the bottom is all the peptides that we identified in the basolateral that had obviously um, were permeable across that monolayer, that CACO2 HD29 monolayer. And several of these peptides we ran through a software analysis and were found to be bioactive or they were predicted to be bioactive. They were um, predicted to be opioid peptides or antioxidant peptides or antibacterial peptides. So we thought, let's have a look at these. Let's synthesize some of these peptides. Okay, so we selected some of these whey peptides that we know had come through the CACO2 monolayers and we synthesized them. And in parallel, we grew muscle cells in the lab. And what we did was we stressed these muscle cells and that's the red column there that's a stressed muscle cell and we're gonna give it an arbitrary unit of 100% stressed. And this would be modeling post-exercise or indeed a very old muscle. And if we give it N-acetyl cysteine, which is the purple column, that's a positive control. It will always reduce stress. So it's reducing the stress from 100 down to about 60%. There's your purple column. What about the peptides that we have synthesized? Well, we find that if we add these peptides to muscle cells, we actually also get a reduction in stress from the 100% down to 40 to 60% with at least five of these peptides. One of these peptides does not help the stress, but five of them do. So that tells us that there are bioactive peptides in whey which will reduce stress in muscle cells. So really what I've tried to do in this webinar was talk to you about the methodologies we have for combining digestion with bioavailability and with bioactivity. For different life stages, for the older consumer, for the infant, and indeed um, for the athlete. Within InfoGest, there is a working group that focuses primarily on intestinal barrier models. And this is made up of 60 scientists from 14 different countries, from 26 research institutions. And the objective of this working group is really to put forward a series of recommendations of how to treat these intestinal barrier models with food that's digested. And then how to compare and contrast the data from these cellular models within vivo data. So this working group three then is divided up into seven sub activities, I would say, sub um, subgroups. And so I apologize in advance now for my poor pronunciation of names, but Alina Kondrashina leads the group on how to deal with food digester before you put it down on these monolayers, how to detoxify it, how to inactivate the enzymes. Do you add protease inhibitors? Do you inactivate by temperature? 
Gianfranco Mamon then works on brush border enzyme activity and that is really how to incorporate this enzyme activity into digestion protocols but also how to protect it on these monolayers when they're incubated with food digester. Shauna Bastianet then looks at allergy and inflammation and how our in vitro models represent real life. Beatrice Mareles then looks at permeability ring trial where we look at how the interlab variation when you're doing the same experiment with similar protocols or the same protocols. Lydia Thomas then looks at colonic fermentation and adds that layer of complexity of putting colonic fermentations, fermentates down on um, monolayers. And then Elena Arnez looks at cellular bioassays and the wide variety of cellular bioassays that are out there to look at bioactivity of these food components. And then Brig Graf looks at the in vitro versus the in vivo data. Does it really truly match what's happening in real life? So if any of the people listening are interested in our working group, please contact me by email and we'd be more than happy to have more members. So I think that's it. Well, thank you very much for your attention and over to you guys. Excellent talk, Linda. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, it was a good overview. So we have time for a number of questions and I might, uh, I might start uh, because I get this question quite often. I got it by email on Monday uh, from Greece, from Elena Dalaka. And she asked a very common question again, um, when you do the in vitro digestion of, of the food, how do you prepare the digester for cell cultures? Because obviously there are a number of uh, uh, inhibitors and toxic elements in, in the digester. Yeah, Andre, that's a very good question. So uh, the problem with the food digester is that it has active digestive enzymes. So you have to find a way of getting rid of them. So there's five main um, ways of getting rid of them. You inhibit them by using protease inhibitors. You heat and activate them. You um, use a molecular weight cutoff to remove them. You dilute it or you use media and FBS. So if we start with the protease inhibitors, what happens there is of course that if you use protease inhibitors, they're going to also affect your brush border activity on your monolayers, and they're also going to interact with the way the cell functions. If you use heat and activation, well, for us, we can't use it if we're looking at a processing, the effect of processing on food digestion. We just can't bring in another thermal step. If you look at molecular weight cutoffs, that's fine if you're do, dealing with dipeptides and tripeptides, but it's a big deal if you're looking at glycosylated proteins or bigger components, food bioactives. If you dilute it, your instrumentation may not be able to detect anything in the basolateral. And then finally, if you use media and FPS, you may mask any health benefit you have from your food digester because the cells are getting plenty of nourishment from the media. So, um, so that's five things you can do, but there's no solutions in any, in any of that. And what people normally do is they use a mix of those things. And um, we have a working group looking directly on that. Alina Kondrashina is looking at that to try and get kind of consensus about what we should and should not be doing. But it's not solved, and, but there are the options at present. Yeah, very good. So if, you have, uh, if anybody else has a question regarding the uh, detoxification you can send an email to Linda because there's a whole work group just dealing with that because it's case by case really what, what yeah. I know. yeah another question Linda is it physiologically relevant to use cancer cells to mimic the gut barrier ex vivo okay that's a question we get for everything we do with <laughs> cell lines really so thank you Moran um, so basically it's not it's they're cancer cells so um, the reason why people use cancer cells, and certainly the reason why we use it in the, I can talk about the gut barrier in a minute, but the reason why we use cancer cells are they're immortalized, which means that they grow independently and they grow easily outside the body. And um, the reason why we specifically use them in gut barrier is because they've been traditionally used by the pharma industry for drugs and drug permeability. So it allows us to compare and contrast our food digester. Um, there are primary cells lines out there, but if you do primary cells, you're taking tissue, you're growing them for a very limited number of times because they're self-limiting, and then you have a lot of experimental variation from day to day. 
So I did mention one of the cell lines there is the IPEC J2, which is a primary immortalized cell line. So I would imagine that more and more people will start using that. But again, it's a little bit more tricky to grow than the CACA 2s HD 29s. So I hope that answers the question. Very good. I have another question from Isida Recio, and she asked, uh, could you comment on the positive and negative control uh, that be used on CACO2 transport studies to ensure monolayer integrity? Okay, so thanks, Isidra. So basically, um, the first thing you do, of course, is these transepithelial electrical resistance, which is to run the electrical current through and measure resistance to make sure you have tight junctions. And then you put your food digester down on these monolayers. So the first really important control is to have a digester control. So that's where you've carried out the whole digester, but it has no food in it. And the importance of that is you need to know what is your background, background noise on those monolayers. Um, luciferous yellow is used to determine that you have tight junctions because its transport is through the paracellular. And then sodium fluorescein, I think its transport is, is more active. So that's another way of looking to make sure your transport systems are up and running. But the best control is the most important thing you will run. Okay, very good. I've answered it. Um, we have a number of questions. We might, uh, we have time for one more. Um, uh, during the talk, Linda might answer the other questions or she types it. If we don't have time during the one hour, uh, we, uh, we probably answer the, all the questions afterwards. Okay, yeah. so there's one more um, um, from Diana Oliveira. Uh, asked if this model can be used to study other nutrients besides peptides. If I want to check what nutrients are being absorbed, for example. Oh yeah, of course. I just use, uh, that's just my area of expertise. So the CACA2 monolayers have been used by lots of different foods. So uh, carotenoids to um, even uptake of vitamins and minerals, uh, uh, much more complex food matrices for fat, fatty acids and all of those things. It's, it's, it's very commonly used. As I said, we brought it from the pharma industry. But it's the interaction between the food digest and the CACA2 that's making it particularly complex for us. And of course, with colonic fermentations, you're looking at bacterial metabolites like short chain fatty acids and things like that. So, very good. Very good. Variety. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I think that's, that's, that, was, that was excellent. Uh, so we might move on to the next speaker. Uh, Adam, can you show yourself? Excellent. Uh, so Adam uh, Maziazanka is a professor at the Gdansk University of Technology. He's also the head of the Department of Colloids and uh, Lipid Science. Um, his research expertise and interest is in the functionality of food colloids and the interaction between food structure and the human uh, digestive system. And most recently, he, he, uh, his research focused on the validation of animal materials such as bile and intestinal mucus for the use of human relevant in vitro digestion models. Okay, so I hand over to Adam again. The talk is pre-recorded and we have a, a live question and answer session. If you have any questions, type them into the question and answer, preferably during the talk. Uh, so we have a little bit of time to uh, uh, go through them. Okay. Hello, this is Adam Maciejanka from Gdańsk University of Technology. I have a pleasure to give you a brief overview on the role of mucus barrier in the transport of nutrients and particles in the small intestine. The mucus in the small intestine covers the surface of mucosa. It's a selective barrier. It can prevent the epithelium from direct contact with microorganisms, including pathogens. It also lubricates the passage of food during the digestion in the gut. And of course, all the nutrients which are released from the food during the digestion would have to be exposed to the mucus on their way to the epithelium. So all the nutrients and bioactives which are released would have to cross the mucus layer in order to get absorbed by the underlying epithelium. The thickness of the mucus layer in the stomach and also in the colon is considered to be larger than the one in the small intestine. Here, it can differ between duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. It can also fluctuate due to, for example, removal of mucus with the foot during the peristaltic motion. 
This image shows a cross-section of the proximal small intestine in the pig. In the dark colors, you can see the mucus layer, which separates the mucosal tissue from the lumen. And when you look at the specimen under the microscope, and here the mucus has been stained for mucins in green, you can see that the mucins, which are one of the major components of mucus, fill the spaces between villi, but also cover the tips of villi in the form of a layer and aggregates. So the mucins have long been considered the major macromolecula and gel-forming component of mucus. Mucins are glycoproteins. In the small intestine, but also in the large intestine, the main secreted mucin is MAC2 mucin. One of the most distinctive features of mucins is the protein backbone with all linked oligosaccharides. This highly glycated region is also called the PTS-rich region. Here the glycation is shown in green color, and in the Golgi of the goblet cells in the epithelium there is formation of diamers, trimers, oligomers of mucins, and eventually the mucins are assembled in the form of granules in the goblet cells. The image on the right hand side is a confocal microscopy of a single villus in the small intestine. Here we can see enterocytes responsible for taking up nutrients. The surface of villus is covered in mucus. So again, the mucins in the mucus have been staining in green color, so they are still either in the form of granules inside the goblet cells, or have already been secreted and contribute to the mucus layer. Here is an atomic force microscopy of MAC2 mucin granules that already expanded to some extent. Inside the granule, the mucins are packed due to calcium-dependent cross-linking, and under physiological conditions of the gut, the expansion of the granule requires an increase in pH and also the removal of calcium. Eventually the mucins would form a laid network with well-defined pores in the mucus, and here we have an example of the mucin network in the mucus removed from the small intestine of the mouse. But very similar organization of the mucin network can be also found in the small intestine of the pig and in humans as well. When you look at the small intestinal mucus under the confocal microscope, you can see that its structure and composition can differ between different locations in the tissue. Here we have again a cross-section of the proximal small intestine in the pig. The image B shows the magnified view of this fragment of the specimen with the connective tissue and villi. And then if we go even further, the location C within the specimen, this is the mucus located between adjacent villi. So the green color represents the mucins in the mucus, whereas the red color shows the nuclei of epithelial cells and the cells of the connective tissue. So when we compare this mucus with the mucus layer, which is sitting on the top of a villus, this is position D, we can see that within the mucus layer, apart from the mucins, there are also particles of DNA embedded. And the DNA particles can be also found in the aggregates of the mucus, which are exposed to the, to the lumen. The coexistence of the extracellular DNA and the mucin in the mucus is even more obvious from this image, showing the tip of a villus with the protective mucus layer. Here we have a magnified view, and in the image C we can see the network of the mucin, whereas in the image D we can only see the DNA in the mucus layer. And the DNA is at various stages of degradation, from almost intact nuclei to the network of small fragments. So where does the DNA come from? The intestinal epithelium undergoes a continuous self-renewal, and the new cells which are produced in the crypts would differentiate and migrate within several days to the villi tips. Eventually they would be removed from the tissue. This is a physiological process, and as a result of it, there is accumulation of the dead cells and the nucleic acids from these cells within the mucus located around villi tips. The contribution of the DNA to the microstructure and permeability of mucus
can be evaluated experimentally using, for example, a multiple particle tracking method. Here we have a schematic representation of the mucus located in between villi and also on the top of the tissue. On the left hand side we have X and Y images showing the mucus at various locations in the tissue. So here for example this is the mucus on the top of the tissue and then in B, C, D and so on we look at the mucus which is located deeper and deeper in between adjacent villi. In this experiment the mucus in all these various locations was incubated with probe particles and then the movement, the diffusion of particles was evaluated experimentally. This is a video clip showing movement of particles in the small interstellar mucus. The principle of the MPT method is that we can track the position of individual hundreds or even thousands of particles in time. And then from their trajectories we can define some parameters of the microenvironments the particles were exposed to. So here for example we can see particles which were immobilized by the mucus structure whereas some other particles were able to diffuse in the other locations of the mucus. This is how raw MPT data usually look like. So we have a broad range of distances covered by individual particles over the time scale of experiment. And this is because as some of the particles could only diffuse in very confined spaces or were completely immobilized by the mucus, whereas other particles were able to diffuse in different locations of the mucus. And here we have examples of the tracks of diffusing particles. The distance data is usually used to calculate mean square displacement. And from the data obtained from individual particles, we can define the families of diffusive particles and also the particles which were immobilized by the mucus, the subdiffusive particles. In our experiment, the mucus which was located on the surface of the tissue was found much less permeable to particles than the mucus located 40 or 80 microns below the top, so between the villi. And this significant difference might have been due to the accumulation of the DNA in the mucus around the villi tips. In experimental practice, the mucus removed from the tissue is usually used. In this collected ex vivo mucus, the coexistence of the mucin network and also the DNA was seen. In order to confirm the contribution of the DNA to the microstructure, but also to the permeability of the mucus, the DNA was selectively hydrolyzed with DNAs. The DNA's treatment caused a very significant improvement in the number of diffusive particles. More than 60% of the particles in the treated mucus were able to diffuse. Whereas in the control mucus, which has not been treated with the DNAs, the particles were immobilized by the mucus structure. In any experiment where spherical particles with well-defined sizes express free diffusion in mucus, the MSD data can be used to calculate the diffusion coefficient of each and every particle diffusing in the mucus. And then the diffusion coefficients can be used to calculate the microviscosity of mucus. Here we have an example of experiment where particles were used to probe heterogeneity of mucus. The particles were incubated with the biocells in order to prevent mucus adhesion and then they were exposed to the mucus. Using the diffusion data it was shown that the small intestinal mucus is very heterogeneous, with the viscosity ranging from the viscosity of water to the viscosity several orders of magnitude larger than the viscosity of water. Translocation of particles in mucus is much more complex if they differ in size or in the surface chemistry. There is a concept of size filtering, which assumes that particles smaller than the mesh size of mucus are allowed to pass while larger particles are rejected. There is also a contrasting concept of interaction filtering, which is based on the strength of interaction between particles and the mucus polymer network. So the weakly interacting particles are not retained in the mucus and allowed to diffuse. A good example of formation of a very complex dispersion of particles 
is the small intestinal digestion of lipids. Here, large droplets of lipids are emulsified with biosalts to the smaller droplets. And finally, there is a formation of a range of mixed micelles, which are composed of the biosalts, phospholipids, and the products of the lipolysis. This is how it looks under the microscope. Here, a single droplet of oil was incubated under simulated small intestinal conditions with pancreatic lipase and biosalts. And due to the action of the enzyme, the triglycerides were digested to fatty acids and monoglycerides at the surface of the droplet. The products of lipolysis and biosalts form spontaneously a mixture of particles that range from large spherical aggregates to smaller ones and also to very small mixed mices, which of course were too small to be seen under this magnification. In the next experiment I want to describe, a similar digesta dispersion was produced from a commercially available yogurt. The yogurt was digested in dynamic in vitro model of gastric, followed by small intestinal digestion that simulated conditions of adult humans. And samples of digesta were removed from the small intestinal compartment after 1, 2, 3 and 4 hours of digestion. And then the penetration of digesta into porcine small intestinal mucus was measured using time-lapse confocal microscopy. The mucus was placed in optical cell under the microscope on one side of the cell, and then on the other side of the cell, the digesta stain for lipids was placed, and the fluorescence profile for lipids was recorded at time zero. The time-lapse microscopy was used to look at the penetration of digesta into the mucus. And after time zero, and then 10 minutes, 20, 30, 60, up to 90 minutes, we can see a progressive penetration of lipids from digesta into the mucus layer. And of course, for every time point of this experiment, the fluorescence profiles for lipids were recorded. And then from the profiles, it was possible to calculate effective diffusion coefficients for digesta in the mucus. This is how the final data look like. The diffusion coefficient of digesta was reduced by about 70% over the first 30 minutes of penetration into the mucus, and then it was constant until the end of the experiment. The reduction might have been due to the clogging of pores and channels inside the surface region of the mucus by the largest particles of digesta. This can suggest that the penetration inside the mucus can only continue after the particles have been reduced to a certain size. It can also suggest that under physiological condition of the gut, the lipolysis can continue after the lipids were moved from the lumen inside the mucus layer on their way to the epithelium. A similar filtering effect of mucus was observed before when sodium alginate was penetrating inside the mucus layer. The incorporation of alginate was used in order to increase the overall viscosity of mucus. And then the diffusion coefficient of lipid digester inside the mucus was measured, and especially for the lipid digester produced after 120 minutes of duodenal conditions. The diffusion coefficient of lipids was reduced significantly relative to the control mucus. This can suggest that uh, such a modification of mucus layer can be a promising strategy in reducing lipid uptake in the small intestine. Experiments on penetration of digesta into the mucus layer can also be used to answer the question whether the porcine mucus which is quite easy to obtain and often used in transport experiments, is actually a good substitute of a difficult to obtain human mucus for human relevant studies. In order to answer this question, we use porcine mucus as a reference material. We collected mucus from the jejunum and the ileum of adult pigs. We also included jejunal mucus collected from piglets in the study. And then the mucus from all these sources was exposed to the lipid digesta, and we measured the penetration of digesta inside the mucus. We also included human mucus in the study, 
The mucus was aspirated during the standard colonoscopy procedure from a number of patients at the clinical hospital. As a part of any colonoscopy procedure, the distal part of the ileum is intubated with the colonoscope, and this is where the aspiration of mucus was done for our study. Calculations of diffusion coefficients of digesta in the mucus collected from the adult pig jejunum and also the pig ileum show that there was no difference in the penetrability of the mucus collected from these two different anatomical locations in the adult pig small intestine. More importantly, the digesta penetrability of the human mucus was very similar to the one observed for the adult pig mucus samples. So the diffusion coefficient of digesta in the human mucus was not statistically different from the diffusion coefficients recorded for the digesta in the adult pig mucus samples. The only mucus which was much more penetrable to lipid digesta was the piglet mucus. And this might have been because of the different structural organization of this mucus, which was more heterogeneous and fragmented. This was probably because of the different kinetics of the mucin secretion and also the cellular turnover in the neonatal gut. And finally, a couple of conclusions for this part of the presentation. The small intestinal mucus collected from adult pigs seems to be a good substitute for a difficult to obtain human mucus in human relevant studies on colloidal transport in the gut. And also, properties of mucus seem to differ quite significantly between different age groups. We saw the difference between adult pigs and piglets here, but it also suggests a similar difference can be observed between adult humans and infants. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Adam, for excellent talk. Uh, so we have time for some questions and I uh, might start. Um, Adam, as you know, in the InfoGest network, we have been working on uh, standardizing digestion methods. Uh, and, uh, you know, at times quite difficult because we want to use established methods. They have to be uh, uh, rock solid, reproducible and so forth. And we've already seen uh, what is on the horizon, meaning population groups, infants and elderly. We have also talked about um, brush border enzymes. There wasn't any consensus when we wrote the last paper, but it's certainly on the horizon. Um, the use of mucin or uh, mucus, is that um, something for the foreseeable future that, that we can use uh, to add to in vitro digestion to make it more accurate? Uh, I think so. Uh, thank you for the question, first, uh, first of all. Um, Especially, you know, over the last years, when we when we look at the mucus and the effect of the mucus, I mean, um, it starts to be obvious that it can really slow down or it can really regulate the, the transfer of nutrients or particles. And you know, 10, 15 years ago, when we started to look at the effect of the mucus, and it was back at, in Norwich, and the, the, the research was initiated by Alan Mackey, then we focused on the mucus which was collected from the tissue. So we look at the effect of things like you know, biocells and uh, whether you can actually freeze the mucus and, can, yeah, and use it later. And then, you know, more recently, we'll look at the, whether the, the mucus uh, from pigs is actually a good model for the human situation. So, uh, and now we know the answer, you know, it, it, it is. Uh, and you now, also, it's getting more and ob more obvious that you know that the structure, the native structure of the mucus in the tissue is very important. So we move from actually using the mucus which was removed from the tissue to the mucus which is still in place, which is, which we call a native mucus. So uh, I remember uh, one of the comments which was made by Linda during her presentation, and she said that uh, one of the limitations of the using chambers at the moment is actually the limitation in the availability of the of the human tissue samples. And the, the, the last slides that I presented in my talk actually showed that the porcine mucus uh, is a good substitute for the human uh, samples. So I would 
imagine that you know at some point we can use, especially using chambers and use porcine tissue as a replacement for the a substitute for the for the human tissue, uh, because then of course we can preserve the the native arch architecture of the mucus. And as I tried to convince you that DNA in the in the tissue in some parts of the mucus is very important in terms of the overall kinetics of the of the penetration by digester, by not by you no know, trace particle, but actually something we call a physiological food digester. So yes, you know, I would uh, imagine that at some point, especially using using chambers, would be part of the of the standard uh, protocol that would you know that would combine digestion and the transport. Uh, part as well. Very good, very good. Okay, Adam, so uh, next question is, in the example of the yogurt digestion penetration into the small intestine mucus, which model was used? Was it an ex vivo tissue model? Uh, no, it wasn't tissue, it was ex vivo mucus. So the mucus was actually removed from the tissue. And when we remove the mucus, you know, the, 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 the layer of the mucus you you obtain, you get is the one which contain the DNA. So this is the that part of the mucus which is exposed to the lumen. So we believe this is the first part of the mucus which is directly exposed to the to the to the digester. And then we use mucus from four different sources. We we focus on comparing the human versus pig. It was for the adult organism, and it was the mucus from the ileum. Then we also compared the mucus from the jejunum and also from the ileum for the pig. And then finally, we compared different age groups and the jejunal mucus from, from piglets and, and the adult pigs as well. So we, we, you know, we just did three comparisons in, in one study. Very good. We have two short questions. So Adam, if you can uh, answer it quickly as well. One is um, the effect of shear. How does it affect the, the muse and, and the absorption? And then there's a question from Tim Lambers. Do the methods you have used for tracking transport also allow the setting to study the turnover of mucus? Okay, okay. the particle tracking for turnover and the first one was the um, um, shear. Uh, the first question about the shear, uh, of course the shear would, would affect the mucus and of course it would affect the overall kinesis of the, of the transfer of nutrients. Uh, towards the epithelium. And actually there was a number of studies looking at the thickness of the mucus. Uh, when you compare them, the, the thickness of the mucus in the ileum or even the jejunum, and the studies were done on rats, as far as I remember, you know, the, the mucus can actually be reduced between, as far as I remember, uh, seven to 20 times, you know, after the, the food actually moved, you know, around the, the small intestine. So, Yes, the shear would affect, especially the thickness of the mucus, that's for sure. And the other question was about using the particle tracking. The yeah, the particle tracking, if you can use it for the turnover of the mucus. You can certainly use it for looking at the uh, turnover of the, of the tissue, because you know, the result of the turnover will be a combination of, for example, the DNA in some parts of the, of the, of the mucus. And uh, one of the slides was actually uh, dealing with that situation. So we, we look exactly this method, the particle tracking to look at different Z positions of the mucus between the line and also on the, on the top of the, of the mucus layer. And we saw, we saw significant differences. So the short answer would be yes, but of course there are many aspects you can look at. Okay, very good, very good. So I would like to thank uh, both speakers, Linda and Adam, for a nice talk and a good question and answer session. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, all questions, we try to answer all questions even afterwards, so you, you, you probably get an email afterwards. If not, just send us an email, uh, uh, just a reminder, a gentle reminder, and we will answer your question. Okay, thank, thank you both. I just have two or three slides before we finish. Uh, at two o'clock, at three o'clock um, Irish time. Give me one second. That's of course the wrong slide, but that's, that's fine. Here we go. So just, uh, um, just to mention that uh, we have this uh, webinar. This webinar will take place every first Wednesday of, of each month, two, two o'clock uh, Irish time. So if you Google Dublin, you know, that, that's the Irish time. Um, the next webinar will be uh, 2nd of December, 6th of January, 3rd of February. Usually uh, we have two speakers and we try to stick to uh, 
uh, one, one hour. Uh, we will publish the uh, all webinars on uh, YouTube afterwards. So if you Google um, InfoGest webinar, you will eventually get there. We have in two locations, one on our own website, Chagas, and the other one on the InfoGest uh, YouTube channel. Um, if you uh, want to be part of InfoGest and want to get an email update, please send, a, send an email to uh, uh, Didier uh, Dupont, who is uh, the chair of uh, InfoGest, or Nathalie Lemar. Uh, I also created an um, uh, InfoGest group on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so if you go to LinkedIn, type InfoGest and follow, you will get the, the uh, regular updates. Um, you can post yourself as well. Uh, so I, I just gave an example down here. Uh, if you want to post my brilliant, my last brilliant paper and such and such, and then uh, uh, type at an InfoGest, uh, you will get the notification. So other people will get the notification. I, I think at the moment we have uh, three or four hundred, quite a quite a quite a few uh, follow the InfoGest uh, channel. So you get news, and it's also a way for you to publicize uh, your research. Uh, just a bit of a background, the InfoGest is an international network. The chair is Didier Dupont and the vice chair is Alain Maki. Uh, we have several working groups. Uh, we have started the first few uh, webinars. Um, first two webinars were on these, these groups here, um, in vitro models and uh, uh, food, um, food interaction uh, with digestion. Uh, today's webinar was on the uh, absorption models. The next uh, webinar will be on uh, digestive lipase and uh, lipid digestion. Uh, that's in December. In January, we look at uh, uh, amylase in the starch or carbohydrate digestion. And in February, uh, we look at in silico models. So if you want to um, present at one of these uh, webinars, please send us an email, either myself or Didier or the workgroup leaders, because in the end it's the workgroup leaders that will select the speakers and that we will publicize that either by email or on the InfoGest on the linked LinkedIn page. Okay, so that's my last slide. Uh, we were about 180 people uh, um, uh, live and uh, usually we have a number, a few hundred people that look at the YouTube channel, so it's a good way of uh, really publicizing your, your research. Okay, so see you next time in uh, December. Uh, goodbye and slon. <laughs>